This morning's reading is from Revelation chapter 18, 4 through 8, and 11 through 20. Just then I heard another shout out of heaven. Get out, my people, as fast as you can, so you don't get mixed up in Babylon's sins, so you don't get caught up in the city's doom. Babylon's sink, sins stink to high heaven. God has remembered every evil she's done. Give her back what she's given, double what she's doubled in her works. Double the recipe in the cup she's mixed. Bring her flaunting in wild ways to torment and tears. Because she gloated, I'm queen over all, and no widow, never a tear on my face. In one day, disasters will crush her. Death, heartbreak, and famine. Then she'll be burned by fire because God, the strong God, who judges her, has had enough. The traitors will carry, will cry and carry on because the bottom dropped out of their business. No more market for their goods. Gold, silver, precious gems, pearls, fabrics of fine linen, purple, silk, scarlet, perfumed wood, and vessels of ivory, precious woods, bronze, iron, and marble, cinnamon and spice, incense, myrrh and frankincense, wine and oil, flour and wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, and chariots, and slaves, their terrible traffic in human lives. Everything you've lived for, gone. All delicate and delectable luxury, lost. Not a scrap, not a thread to be found. The traders who made millions off her kept their distance for fear of getting burned and cried and carried on all the more. Doom, doom, the great city doomed. Dressed in the latest fashions, adorned with the finest jewels, in one hour such wealth will be wiped out. All the ship captains and travelers by sea, sailors and toilers of the sea, stood off at a distance and cried their lament when they saw the smoke from her burning. Oh, what a city! There was never a city like her. They threw their dust, they threw dust on their heads and cried as if the world had come to an end. Doom, doom, this great city doomed. All who owned ships or did business by sea got rich on her, getting and spending, and now wiped out in one hour. O oh, heaven, celebrate and join in, saints, apostles, prophets. God has judged her. Every wrong you suffered from her has been judged. The word of God for the people of God. Please pray with me now. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. The book of Revelation is a dream, and the stories and the language and the images that are in this book are often of nightmares. This morning, you heard part of one of them. 
How do we understand what is being described here? Yes, there is a political history to this text. There is a time and place that this was written about, but it's also meant to echo a much bigger message. There's an artistic component to this text this morning. One of the commentators points out that the author of this part of the book has described the nightmare from the perspective of people who are standing far away from it. We don't directly look at the bad thing that is happening. Instead, we look at the people lamenting over the bad thing that is happening. We look at its effects on people rather than directly at it. And the commentator suggested that the reason that that is so is because the author understands that we might have more than one feeling about the nightmare described in this text. And to look at it so indirectly allows us space for our own thoughts and feelings, which are not easy or simple. This is a nightmare of luxuries. The history that's being described in this text is even more describing a dynamic that is happening today because at this time, the ancient reference point of Babylon was used to uh, refer almost like a nickname to Rome. And the incredible inequality between the haves and the have-nots in Rome. Luxury was not neutral. It never has been. And it certainly was not then because none of the sumptuous things that were available to the rich in that time, and boy, were they available, were possible without the enslavement and oppression of many, many more peoples. And that reality is true now, too. The nightmare is that even when there are some things of uh, delectable quality, of beauty, of sumptuousness, what we see in Rome at that time, and if we step back in our own as well, is that the presence of luxury does not make life more precious. In fact, what they found then and what some of us find now is that the nightmare of luxury is that at a certain point, nothing feels special. At a certain point, possibly connected to the kind of hard-heartedness we have to cultivate in order to look away from those who are exploited for the sake of luxury, I don't know. At some point, it feels like nothing has value. At this time in Rome, there are historians from outside of the biblical tradition, just citizens, right? Citizen historians who are coming from different perspectives who were describing some of the activities that were going on in the culture at that time. And some of the things they're talking about are pretty extreme. They talked about how common it had become at a certain point, what a fad it was, to dissolve pearls in wine or in vinegar, spirits, as a beverage, like to show that you could afford to do that. To take a pearl that was worth thousands or tens of thousands and just dissolve it as a party drink. That was a common practice, to show that you could. Demonstration of power. But also some of the things that they were describing are not so hard for us to imagine or relate to. At that time, people would have competitively high rents. And if you were a person of a certain position, it would be embarrassing to you if you weren't spending a certain dollar amount on the place that you lived. That demonstration of wealth, of privilege, of power was very important at that time. And yet, the nightmare of luxury is that 
Sometimes when luxury is directing everything, nothing feels special. Nothing feels like it has value. One of the things that I'm thinking about now, um, I heard recently, and I don't know the survey data that this is based on, but as a reference point to our culture right now, one of the things that was described is that in uh, 1980, the average American would purchase about 12 new items of clothing per year. In 1980, the average American would purchase about 12 new items of clothing per year. Now, the average American purchases 68 new items of clothing per year. And part of that statistic is that most of those items are worn only three or four times before they're thrown away. Now, I'm going to confess, and I'm betting that I'm not the only one in this room who feels this way. I heard that and I was like, phew, at least I'm not that bad. <laughs> but I don't think that's the truth that this statistic is meant to bring forward. I think the message underneath this is that there's something going on in terms of value and exploitation that is part of the larger system. Yes, we could say, oh, this is a personal problem. People need to discipline their spending a little bit more. They need to outfit repeat. They need to be more sustainable in their practices. Yeah, you could see it that way, or you could recognize that the twinning of these facts about what we bring into our lives and how quickly it passes out of our lives suggests an entire system that is based on the exploitation of peoples, the availability of cheap labor and the usage of cheap materials to distract us from the real economic issues that we have, where so many people in our society cannot afford real shelter, real nourishment, real warmth and security. And so we dress them up in the appearance of it. Empty calories, cheap materials, shoddy construction. We could say it's a personal problem, or we could recognize that our whole culture, just as in that time that was being referred to in this text, we have invested in systems that give us access to luxury, but where Nothing has value. That is the nightmare. And at that time, by that author, just as much as in this time, among us, the recognition that slavery is an abomination right? and cannot be a taken-for-granted thing, whatever words we use to describe it or policies we use to dress it up, no matter how far away from this country it takes place. This is the nightmare. So where does help come from? One of the things that's being described in this text is that help feels far away. People are mourning the massive change to everything that they know, the destruction of the things that have comforted them or helped them participate in society. There are so many people, tradesmen, this passage in Revelation goes on and on. Trades, politicians, local officials, craftspeople. There are so many people who have depended on the presence of this disparity and unjust system that are mourning now, not knowing how they will survive, what can come next. Where does help come from? It is not going to come from their economic system that has failed them totally. It is not going to come from single actors or government forces. The author makes it very clear that those who have spent time supplicating themselves to and worshiping individual officials find that there is no help there for them at all when time comes. Where does help come from? 
Every good and perfect gift comes from God. And we find it in our community, real help coming through the lives of neighbors. Neighbors and volunteers. The promise in this text, which is very hard to hear and spot even when you're reading it, the promise in this text is the call to come out from their people and celebrate. Come out from their people and celebrate. Not doing a dance of revenge, but recognizing that people is plural, not individual. That if you come out from there, if you come out from that system, guess what? You're going to have the same support structures you always did because you'll turn your head to the right and to the left and you'll see that your neighbors are there. And when we look in our actual lives now, where does our help come from? Does it not come from the people who bring food when we are devastated by grief? Does it not come from the person who gives us a listening ear when we are overwhelmed and anxious? Does it not come from the person who continues to answer our call with a smile in their voice even after they've known us for 20 years and witnessed our mistakes? Does it not come from organizations like UMCOR, which is almost entirely volunteer? Does it not come from EMTs and paramedics? Does it not come from volunteer firefighters? Systems of support throughout many of the co communities in states like New Hampshire that are not professionalized. Does it not come from the teachers and volunteers who show up early for the school day and stay late to look after that one sheep who would otherwise go missing. The dream in the midst of this nightmare, the dream of promise, is that loving your neighbor actually does matter even in the time of an election, even in the time of natural disasters, even in the time of an uncertain economy and future, even in the time of housing crisis, love matters. It always has. There's a song I love by Chuck Prophet. He sings, when the war is over, I'll still be your brother. Love is a hurting thing, but love is the only thing anymore. Loving your neighbor does matter. I was thinking about this because I was thinking about a time when I was being trained to be part of a disaster response team with UMCOR because of my particular um, gifts and uh, skill set, I was going to be part of the emotional and spiritual response team, listening to people and helping churches worship when they had been right in the center of something terrible. And as a part of this training, I was joined together with people who were planning to build houses and bring medical support and all other kinds of things. And we learned about the logistics of how UMCOR is an organization that partners together with more than 70 interfaith, local, civic, federal programs, all different kinds, completely diverse, to come to a common understanding of how to love neighbor in the midst of disaster. We help each other. We bring our different gifts. We love each other as neighbors, even in a systematic way. And as we were learning about all the particularities of how to do this work and do it well, one person asked in the question and answer time a very helpful question that I'm sure was on many of our minds. They said, um, how do, so how do we get um, like reimbursement for our lodging or our travel? Where does that come from? I don't know how many of you have been in the position to be able to ask this question. Maybe you don't know. 
But the United Methodist Committee on Relief deploys volunteers to disaster areas all over the world in large numbers to do the work of door-to-door -door knocking and one-by-one -one entering names of people who have uh, been displaced so that we don't lose track of anyone. You know, it's, it's an enormous undertaking. They were asking, how does it work with the travel and the lodging? How do we get reimbursed for that? What's the support structure? And the train, the trainer was for a moment a little bit thrown off guard and said to, then to the group, oh, it's volunteer. It's volunteer. What we all realized in a moment of silence just like this one was, oh, you show up or you don't. That's the only way it works. Whether it's something in that extreme or something as local as a neighbor who's had a fall, you show up or you don't. Love is the only thing anymore. But just like the problem, it doesn't have to be dealt with on a personal level. It can actually be a kind of love that changes our systems and structures. Participating in UMCOR, supporting UMCOR, sharing the stories about it as I just did, this is a way that we are inspiring people to see what's possible in the world differently. And it has changed the world and bent it toward peace and healing. It does matter. There's also uh, philosophies like impact investing, which is where uh, investors, whether they're individuals or organizations, look at the consequences of their investments. And they prioritize benefits to the community over financial gain. This doesn't mean there is no financial gain, but the priority is benefit to the community first. This is based on the principle that when we dissolve some of that distance between who has and who has not, when we lift up and actually mean, meaningfully transform our systems to empower people, to come together, to access resources, to have real shelter, real warmth and nourishment, real community, then we all experience a better community. We all benefit from that. Examples of this is that the uh, United Methodist Church globally has made decisions to divest from alcohol and tobacco in terms of our stock market investments, things like nuclear, weaponry, and most recently, we've been discussing, pressing, exploring, divesting from fossil fuels. The biggest argument against doing so is that these are incredibly profitable investments. A significant portion of the benefit that comes from investing in the stock market comes from investing in fossil fuels. But the discernment of the church, even on that systemic level, is at what cost? When we invest in an alcohol company or a tobacco company or what have you, we are empowering them to speak with our voice, to do more because of the power they appear to have in the world. That matters. It's true that when we make choices like this to focus on impact investing, when we choose to show up for our neighbors and give a little bit of what we have to give, whether it's our time, our energy, our clothing, our mementos, our food, our finance, when we choose to do that, we have a little bit less room in our lives for luxury. That's true. But I think we also benefit from the dream of grace that happens when we move from a nightmare of luxury in which nothing has value 
into practices and actions that tell the message that humans, all humans, have sacred worth, then we find that everything has value. Everything has value. From a nightmare of luxury to a dream of grace, God be our guide. Amen.